Lecture 9, Advanced Dynamics Problems 1, Rocketry. What makes rocketry problems advanced is the fact that the mass is changing with respect to time. So a rocket starts from a height 0 with an initial mass mi, but half of that is fuel. And it's expelling fuel at a rate q. q is a fuel flow rate. And the, it, it represents a change in mass with respect to time. So Q is negative, the rate of change of the rocket's mass with respect to time. The fuel leaves with a constant velocity. And if the height stays small enough, we're going to approximate constant gravity acceleration. And our task is to find the rocket's height as a function of time. Newton's second law gives us the acceleration is the net force over the mass, as usual. And the so what we're going to be able to do is use the exact same physics that we've used all the way up to this point, except now because the mass is changing, we're going to get some different, uh, some different types of differential equations that are a little bit more difficult to solve. And the uh, the other new piece of physics that we've got, besides the idea that the mass is changing, is how much force is produced by this expelling fuel. Okay, so we'll solve for the mass as a function of time just by saying it's the initial mass minus the flow rate times the time. And you can go through the integral to get that, but the flow rate is constant, so it's just multiplying by time when you integrate. And in this particular case, half the initial mass was fuel. So we could solve for the time when the fuel runs out by saying the time would be the mass over 2 divided by the flow rate. So flow rate has units of mass per time. And so if you divide the mass by the flow rate, you'll get units of time. We can find the force from the fuel from conservation of momentum. The rate of momentum transfer to the fuel in the frame of the rocket is dp by dt, is qv fuel. Let's check the units of this. Q is mass per time. Velocity is velocity units, meters per second. So we've got mass times velocity per time, and that would be a momentum per time. From Newton's second law, we've got that the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. So this rate of change of momentum is the force on the on the rocket from the fuel. So the force of the fuel is Q, its flow rate, times its velocity. That's going to be true for rocketry in general. Therefore, the rocket's acceleration is given by the force over the mass. And until it runs out of fuel, that's given by the gravity acceleration plus the force from the fuel. And then after that point, it's just the gravity acceleration. You can integrate this once if we want to find the velocity as usual and twice to find the position. Okay, question. What determines whether the rocket is going to be able to lift off initially? Well, uh, we'll need that the initial force is positive. So basically we need the fuel force to overpower the gravity force, right? Exactly. Fuel force has to be bigger than the gravity force. When's the rocket's upward acceleration the largest? Looking at this equation, we're just going to think about that. When would this be the biggest? Well, as time increases, the mass decreases. So actually, its acceleration is increasing all the way through its trajectory until just before it runs out of fuel. What is the rocket's max height? The maximum height, how would we get that? Well, we would integrate. Is it just before it runs out of fuel? Well, no, because it still has a positive velocity at that point if it was flying upwards. And the it's going to take some time before the velocity is going to go back down to zero. That's going to be where it reaches a maximum height. So where the velocity is zero, substitute that into the height equation. Some specific numbers. Suppose the rocket has initial mass of 2 kilograms, 1 kilogram of which is fuel, and it expels 0.1 kilograms per second of fuel at a relative velocity of 250 meters per second. Find and plot the rocket's acceleration, velocity, and position as functions of time, and then find the rocket's maximum height. You should use Maple to help with doing the actual numbers for this question, so getting the specific numbers and answers and the plot and all that. So give that a shot. Okay, here's some sample code. If you couldn't uh, get it to work, or you can check out yours. Some functions that are helpful for this are the, the piecewise function. This is what, uh, this allows you to specify different values of a depending on the values of its uh, of its input. So a is equal to this if this condition is true and it's equal to this negative g if this condition is true. So the piecewise syntax you go 
it's it kind of expects the input in a different format than it'll write it out later so it writes it out as kind of value condition value condition that's typical math syntax for this but the piecewise function itself expects you to give it condition and then the value for that condition and then value you'll notice we're using int to do these integrals and then uh, putting in a bit of a simplify to make it a little bit nicer afterwards and uh, you'll see we have some lawns and lawns multiplied by t so maple really saves us a lot of time you could have done these integrals by hand but it would require some integration by parts and so that's a bit time consuming then we're going to plot this uh, I'm plotting a times 20 and v times 5 just so that everything is going to show up on a, in a reasonable size on the on the plot so this is not the acceleration this is the acceleration times 20 so the let's talk about this the acceleration increases as the mass is decreasing and you see actually it it increases quite a lot so as the mass decreases from its initial value then uh, we get a, a pretty big increase in acceleration over time while this is happening the velocity is increasing as well because the acceleration is positive and because the acceleration is increasing the velocity increases at a super linear rate so at a like a power that is greater than one then once we reach the point where the rocket runs out of fuel acceleration jumps down to negative 9.81 and so multiplied by 20 it's around negative 200 the velocity starts decreasing at a constant rate and then somewhere around i guess 17 point 17.5 or 17.8 seconds the rocket has zero velocity and reaches a maximum height you could try to zoom in on the plot and pick this off or you can use the maximize function which will tell you what the maximum value is of this so we've got this function of one variable and uh, and all you need to do is tell maple maximize that uh, that function and you'll get out the uh, value of the max there so it's not even uh, it's not even strictly speaking what maple calls a, a function in that we haven't used y to map t to some uh, to to this parameter it just includes uh, it, it's kind of like a maybe an inline function of t or a one line expression yeah expression I think is the right word for that okay acceleration changes abruptly as the rocket runs out of fuel the discontinuity in a means a kink in the velocity graph but it's still smooth so discontinuous a can mean continuous uh, continuous velocity all that the discontinuity in a means is that the velocity it has a kink in it so it has a discontinuous derivative and the position is completely continuous all right rocket example two this one uh, you can do more on your own it's uh, it's an exercise for you to repeat the rocket example but if you have a variable amount of initial fuel so last time we said that the initial fuel was equal to the initial mass this time we're just going to say you need to lift a 500 gram payload to the maximum possible height and you can put on as much fuel as you like but whatever fuel you put on is going to have these parameters it exhausts at 0.1 kilograms per second and it goes out at a pretty fast nozzle velocity of 250 meters per second how much fuel should you carry and what's the maximum height you can reach so this involves solving the problem again but with a variable amount of initial fuel uh, so we'll call the just to make things a bit simpler we'll call the payload mass m and the fuel mass little m so big m for payload little m for the fuel the fuel burning time would be whatever the initial fuel was initial fuel mass was divided by the flow rate which is a constant the acceleration as before uh, negative g plus the thrust force over the mass and we've got a constant thrust thrust force because that just depends on the velocity of expelling fuel and the flow rate of expelling fuel so if you start out with so much fuel that weight is greater than thrust then the initial acceleration is going to be negative as long as thrust is greater than weight you should have as much fuel as possible because this extends the positive acceleration time this kind of makes sense so in this one up here if we were to start with a little bit more fuel so that it was heavier initially uh, resulting in an acceleration that starts down here we'd have more time to positively accelerate and more time to pick up initial velocity 
So the optimum amount of initial fuel is the one where the acceleration is initially zero. This is the optimum in terms of maximum height that you can reach. Since the acceleration is so small at the beginning, it may not be the most economical way to do this because you're spending just as much money on the fuel there, but that fuel doesn't get you very far because most of the, uh, most of the mass is, uh, because that fuel mass brings the acceleration so close to zero. Okay, substituting in, you should come up with a plot like this which tells us a maximum height of about 3,200. Next for a quite difficult problem. This is the misaligned rocket thruster. So what we're doing in this case is we're looking at the shuttle. So that here's a picture of a space shuttle that I got off Wikipedia. It's the space shuttle discovery at the start of STS-120 on 23rd October, 2007. And what we're gonna imagine is what would happen if 60 seconds into its launch, we have a terrible accident where one of the booster rockets, these ones on the side, falls off. Okay, so this big thing in the center here, this carries the fuel for the shuttle itself. And, uh, and after it gets to a certain amount of height under normal operation, this fuel starts, uh, starts blasting out the back of the shuttle there. But we're gonna ignore, uh, ignore that part of the motion, and we're just going to consider these booster rockets, how those things are operating. The booster rockets put out a massive amount of thrust force. Okay, so the booster rocket detaches early, and then we've got the actual numbers about the uh, for the space shuttle here. The thrust force of each booster rocket is uh, 14 million newtons. The total mass at this point is 24 megagrams of shuttle and payload. So that's the, the white part here. Then 760 megagrams of the external tank, this kind of reddish brown thing. And then 400 megagrams is the remaining booster's remaining mass. This is how much mass is left in that booster. The shuttle at this time has a velocity of 433 meters per second and an altitude of 11.5 six kilometers and no longer any angular velocity. The booster's thrust's line of action is about six meters off from the shuttle center of mass and we're going to approximate the moments of inertia of the shuttle pieces as one twelfth of ml squared. So just take them as rods spinning about their center but assuming l equals 47 meters for all three remaining pieces so these are the lengths and the the issue is that the center of mass is going to be off from the center of mass, the combined center of mass of all three. So although their moments of inertia about their individual centers of mass are these, we're going to have to use the parallel axis theorem to find out their moments of inertia about the combined center of mass of all three pieces. Assume the booster is losing mass at a rate of this and will detach after another 60 seconds. So we're just going to analyze over that range. Write down the shuttle's rotational differential equation of motion and numerically solve for the shuttle's angle as a function of time. Then write down the shuttle's translational differential equation of motion and solve for the shuttle's translational differential equation. Uh, solve the shuttle's translational differential equation of motion. We're going to simplify parts of this problem by just taking gravity to be a constant 9.81 meters per second squared. What makes this problem so difficult is that one, the mass of the booster rocket is changing. And so the center of mass's location is changing for the three pieces. Then that means that, so both of those things together mean that the moment of inertia of this about its center of mass is changing because the booster rocket is misaligned with the, with the center of mass. Then we're also going to get a torque acting on this uh, combination as the as as time progresses and that's going to turn into an angular acceleration which is going to change the angle then the angle determines which direction the force on the object is and so the translational equation of motion is going to depend on the result of the rotational equation of motion looking at some of the answers for that we can write out what the center of mass would be as a function of the booster mass and we know the booster mass as a function of time. 
The torque that the booster produces is ab about the center of mass is the vector from the center of mass to where the thrust force is located crossed with the thrust force. And actually the thrust force is not just displaced to the right, but it's displaced to the right and down. But you know that this, uh, that part of the, so if we were to take the vector from the center to the actual bottom of the rocket and cross that with the downward with the backward uh, thrust force, we get the same cross product as if we just do the perpendicular distance multiplied by the thrust force. So that's what we do here. We do the I displacement, we ignore the J displacement to the thrust force location and cross that with the thrust force. So the uh, the force, the, yeah, so I, I pointed down here, this is the fuel expulsion direction. This creates a force on the rocket in the positive J direction. Okay, so we've got that crossed with this, and I crossed J is K. This means that it would cause it to spin in the K direction or the counterclockwise direction. That makes sense. The moment of inertia from the parallel axis theorem, we can use the shuttle and the tank. Those are at the same X coordinate, let's say, uh, X coordinate of zero. And so the distance from the center of mass for them would just be uh, X bar squared. Whereas the booster, its distance from the center of mass is its location, 6M minus X bar all squared. The angular acceleration, the rate of change of the rate of change of the angle with respect to time is tau divided by I. And the angle here is measured from the vertical. So we're taking a theta equals zero as uh, straight up. By doing this, we just have to be careful about what we're going to uh, what we're going to use when we translate it into translational motion. You can also take theta equals 90 degrees at the start and just use the angle from the horizontal, but you still have to be careful about the force direction. So uh, we can substitute all of that into maple and uh, come up with after making some plots, magnifying the angular acceleration and the angular velocity, just so we can see them on the plot. Angular acceleration doesn't change all that much. And it's a, it's a fairly large positive value, which over the course of 60 seconds leads to a fairly big angular velocity and a ridiculous number of rotations. So this is, this is in radians, 500 radians is a huge amount of, uh, of rotations undergone in 60 seconds. You can see at the end of this omega multiplied by 10, we've got, what is that? Looks like about 100 and 180, so 18 for the angular velocity, and then dividing, uh, dividing that by two pi. You can see at the end of this, we're rotating, the, the shuttle is spinning around at three rotations a second. So like a boom, 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 boom. This sounds uh, like bad news for anybody on board. The translational differential equation of motion is a fair bit more complicated to solve, but not too difficult to write down. So it would be mass times acceleration is the thrust force plus the force from gravity. The mass times acceleration thrust force, which way is the thrust force pointing? Well, it's this constant value multiplied by negative sine theta in the X and cos of theta in the Y. Let's check this. We said that theta was the angle we're making counterclockwise from the vertical. So as we start to increase theta, then we're increasing in the negative x direction. That makes sense. At theta is zero, we've got a zero and a one. When theta is 90 degrees, it should be pointing directly to the left. That checks out. When theta is 180 degrees, it should be pointing down. Yep, it works. Okay, so this is our angle function. And uh, we've also got some force from gravity, which is just pointing in the negative y direction. Our initial conditions are uh, R at zero, 11.6 kilometers in the J direction, and R prime, 433 meters per second J. Those were given in the question. Theta and mass are determined from the rotational problems results up here. Okay, we can do a similar thing in Maple and substitute this in. Your version of Maple may be different. I'd love to hear about that. Uh, the, the version of Maple I'm using, Maple 11, in doing this just hangs. So it looks like it's taking a very long time to solve. It'll go on for hundreds of seconds and eventually just crash. 
So you have to stop the calculation partway through if it seems like it's just taking a long time and not giving you anything. And uh, th this I'm concluding is because there's too many nested levels of integration for Maple to solve. It's really better to do, uh, to do some discrete time stepping like you can get with Flex PDE. Before we look at that, we're going to summarize the differential equation and boundary conditions. So the rotational problem, we have this booster mass, center of mass calculation, torque, moment of inertia, different, giving us this differential equation with these initial conditions. Translational differential equation on top of the, the total mass written here, then the differential equation itself, vector differential equation, and these initial conditions to go along with it. Okay, so the this this uh, represents the first part of the kind of problems that you're going to have to do on the test. So the first part of the of the test problems are going to be come up with differential equations and initial conditions, and then the second part are going to be to solve those using maybe Maple to help, using maybe Flex PDE, depending on the particular problem. Let's jump over to Flex PDE. This is something that you're going to be looking at in the tutorials. Flex PDE is a, so this we're using it because we've got a free student version and because it's scripted, this gives us a, a good way to write down the problem there. So how you use Flex PDE, this is just going to be a brief overview. You can go over this uh, in detail on your own and in the tutorial by talking to your TA. Now the variables that we set up at the beginning, these are the ones we're going to be solving for. Flex PDE's student version, unfortunately, can only solve for five variables at a time. We can't solve for all six. So one thing that we can do is we can just solve it one time looking for the X displacement and then solve it another time looking for the Y displacement. So commenting happens with an exclamation mark. These are the so the variables you set up here are the ones that you're going to be solving uh, with differential equations. The definitions, just any sort of set of constants or expressions like the, the things that aren't determined by differential equations, like the mass, things dependent on, uh, on time, like the booster mass and all that. You can put expressions in here. Any kind of complicated things that need DEs need to be in the equations section. Set up our initial values and equations. So different, this is, these are the differential equations substituted in. The highest derivative with respect to time that you can do in Flex PDE is first order time. So if you want to do second order time, the trick is to specify the, uh, the velocity as the rate of change, uh, as, as the rate of change of position. So we've got the position determined by saying, well, the derivative of position is velocity. And up here, we said the derivative of velocity is the acceleration. And we do one of those for each dimension. The boundary regions, because this is a 1D problem, don't actually uh, don't actually matter. But you do have to set up something so that Flex PDE uh, will, uh, will solve the equation. The time is 0 to 60. And then we're going to plot some uh, results. We're going to look at the velocity in x, in y, and the x displacement, moment of inertia, the frequency, the angular velocity, and the angle. Okay, let's give this a shot. Okay, so here's the angle, and we, we got the same answer as we did with maple. It's good to start part of the problem with uh, with maple and do whatever you can there and uh, and then kind of check out whether the answer that you get with flex PDE for that agrees with your maple version so that was why we wanted to do that problem in maple as well it's kind of a check of what we're going to be of what we did here with flex PDE then we can look at the angular velocity that's all that also agrees with what we found earlier the what we couldn't find with maple was what the x velocity would be as a function of time. And here's the x velocity. So you see it's sort of because of the spinning and directing force in different direction, we're sort of rocking back and forth in x velocity and uh, ending up with a an x position that's decreasing. Because we spent our initial time before we sw uh, swung around moving, if anything, in the x direction, we end up with a net velocity in x and an overall displacement in x. This isn't quite a linear function. You can see there's some rippling in it because uh, because we're starting to spin around really quick 
as as the shuttle's moving off to the left there. It had a positive Y velocity because of the initial upward velocity, but then started to decrease due to the acceleration of gravity. The spinning acceleration sort of uh, sort of evens out because of the spinning. Great, and there's our shuttle problem.